Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa liya salihin. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. Khatam al-anbiya'i wa mursaleen. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala abdika wa rasulika muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa ashabi. Wa man da'a bi da'watihi wa stanna bi sunnati ila yawm al-deen. Wa sallam tasliman kathira. Amma ba'd. All praises are due to Allah, Lord of the worlds. And surely Allah is the friend and protector of the righteous. And I bear witness that Allah is one and has no partners. And that Muhammad, the son of Ab Abdullah, is his servant, his last messenger. May Allah always and constantly send peace and blessings to Muhammad, to his family, to his companions, to all those who call to his way and establish his sunnah to the day of judgment. As to what follows, I begin with the greeting words of the righteous. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, it is a great privilege uh, to be with you here tonight. Uh, and I pray that Allah would make you successful uh, and would continue to bless uh, this community and the Muslims uh, in this region. This is a very unique time that we are going through now. Muslims, the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is at the crossroads. It's at the crossroads. In one direction is imminent destruction. A well-orchestrated plan of destruction for this Ummah. But in the other direction there is light. There is light, there is hope for us. And the decisions that we're making now are crucial, serious decisions. The moves that we make, that our leadership is making, the direction the young people are going in, uh, will have a serious impact on our lives and on the lives of people throughout the world. I have spent the last uh, 30 years traveling throughout the Muslim world, uh, living with Muslims in different conditions. And as a person who had embraced Islam and who had embraced the Muslim world, and learn to speak the Arabic language, traveling amongst the people. I was finding um, different signals and messages that I was getting. On the one hand, we have so many Muslims in so many places. Masjids are filled in many parts of the world. We have extremely rich people in the Ummah. Some of the richest people on earth are actually Muslims. We have great standing armies. We have intellectuals. We have books. You can take the books of hadith and tafsir and fiqh and you can put it on a disc, put it on a chip, and you put it in your pocket. But at the same time, there's a contradiction. With the great wealth, there is uh, poverty, extreme poverty. With the great armies, is a feeling of frustration. This frustration is leading Muslims to feel uh, a state of despair, um, to drive Muslims to do things that we have never seen before in the Ummah. People burning themselves to death is unprecedented in our Ummah. It is a Buddhist action. The Buddhists used to do that during the Vietnam War and other times the Buddhists used to do that. But for Muslim to go to this extent shows the level of frustration and despair that we are feeling, the oppression that we are feeling, knowing that we can do so much, but we're being blocked from doing it. Knowing that we have so much riches in our ummah, but yet we can't get a job. We cannot feed our families. And so it is leading people into the streets. It is leading people uh, uh, to, to, to make extreme moves. And they're hoping for something to happen. Hoping for something to happen. And we can only make dua and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would protect and bless the Muslims in Tunisia and Egypt and Algeria. In this region here who are in the streets. Who are in the front lines now. To make this change. 
This region has always been a very important uh, land in the hot lands of Islam. And the events that happened there, no doubt, will have an impact uh, on the rest of the Muslim world. And so we are in extremes. And in my travels, I live with Muslims in the southern part of Africa and uh, in Pakistan and in the Sahara, at Kubra, the Sahara Desert, living with Muslims in certain places where they, in Ramadan, they hardly had enough to break their fast. Then I moved to the Gulf region, and I spent a year living in the Gulf, and I found Muslims with so much wealth, they didn't know what to do with it. It's the same Ummah, it's the same Shahada, the same uh, Creator, the same Prophet والسلام, but extremes, we're in extremes. We have the same uh, human uh, tests and challenges in front of us. We have the same fate to live in this dunya for a short period of time, but we are living in extremes. And Allah Azza wa Jal tells us in Surah Al-Anbiya, "Kullu nafsin dha'iqatul maut." In speaking in general, every soul must taste death. But in the same verse uh, there, which is uh, verse number thirty-five, after saying "Kullu nafsin dha'iqatul maut," wa nabluakum bishadri wal khairi fitna, wa ilayna turjaun. Allah said, "Every soul." will taste death. But we will test you. We will test you with evil and good. A fitna. It will be a trial and a tribulation. And all of you will return to us. And so, Sadaqallah al-Azim, we are see it, seeing it happen today. This fitna we are under. The Prophet ﷺ even said in one authentic hadith, Inna li kulli umma fitna, wa fitna tu ummati al mal. Every nation has a trial and test, but the trial and test of my nation is wealth. We would have too much or not enough. It's an extreme that we are on. At the same time, with the rise of the Muslim world and with the decline of the Western countries, we have become a target. We have been misunderstood. We have been uh, uh, maligned. They have said things about us that are not true, distorted our history, distorted our message, and this is only adding to our frustration. But in times like this, we need to uh, Seek refuge in Allah Azza wa Jal. Seek refuge in Allah, patience and prayer. And also, the example of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he go through? Look at his example and his followers in a time like this in order that we get a type of opening, a type of understanding of the greater picture. It is reported in the early days in Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ and his companions were being tortured, driven out of their homes, abused, humiliated. The Prophet ﷺ himself, people following him around, calling him names, throwing uh, intestines and filthy things on top of his head. And one person in particular, named Al-As ibn Iwail al-Sahami, he used to follow the Prophet ﷺ, and whenever the Prophet, peace be upon him, would speak to the tribes that would come in, Al-As would say, this man is useless, he is abtar. And abtar, when we say this in the Arabic, we are talking about a person who is cut off, and in a paternalistic uh, society like that, it, it, it also refers to the fact that he has no male descendants. He has no males who will protect his family, who will sing his, his praises, who will carry on his genealogy. And so, in that type of society, to a certain extent, he has no future. So, so Al-As would say this about the Prophet ﷺ, calling him Abtar. 
And sure, this must have hurt the Prophet, peace be upon him, as a man growing up in Mecca at that time and having feelings. This, this, was, this was one of the worst things that you can possibly say to personally hurt this individual. You want to hurt him in a way that will go right down to his essence. And it is reported during these dark days that the Prophet ﷺ one night he smiled and he told his wife that Jibreel ﷺ had come to me. And he has revealed to me a beautiful chapter in the Quran. He has revealed to me, A'udhu Billahi min shaitan the rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Inna a'tayna al kawthar for salli le rabbika wan har in nashaniyaka hu al abtar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet, peace be upon him, Inna a'tayna al kawthar. Verily, we have given you an abundance. We have given you al kawthar. That is also understood to be a beautiful river in Jannah that pours into the watering place, al Haud, for the day of resurrection. The liquid inside of al kawthar is as cold as ice, as sweet as honey, as white as milk. If you drink it one time, you will never be thirsty again. Inna a'tayna al kawthar so pray to your Lord and sacrifice. In the Shaniyaka, who will abtar? The one who insults you, he will be cut off. This chapter revealed to the Prophet, peace be upon him, is a standing miracle. It is revealed in a time of extreme oppression, a time of frustration. A time of feeling like you, you, you just can't make it. You only had a few followers. And this beautiful chapter is revealed. And what is so interesting about it, it only contains 10 words. It is the shortest chapter in the Quran. And I can believe that probably everybody here has memorized al Uh Those who memorize al Kautar, raise your hand. Everybody, that's the one, if you want to do an express salat, then you read Al-Kawthar, Falak, Nas, Ahad. Everybody knows Surat Al-Kawthar. It is the smallest chapter in the Quran, but the miracle about it, it is expanding and expanding and expanding and will continue to expand until the day of resurrection. How is this possible? When... The, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ looked at this chapter and the scholars who followed them. They found that the word al kautha from al kathura that this word is in Arabic, the form of the word is called mutlaq, ghayr mahduda. It is an open-ended word. So the meaning is open-ended. So we would translate it, one of the translations given uh, to this word is an abundance. An abundance. Like it's a lot of things. It continues and continues. It's an abundance. So when Allah said this, He said, Verily, we have given you an abundance. What is Al-Kawthar? When the companions looked at this and the scholars looked at this, they said, Al-Kawthar, it is... Uh, Kalima to Tawheed, it is Tawheed itself, it is Shahada. Because by getting La ilaha illallah, he is connected with all of the prophets and messengers from the beginning of time. He is directly connected to Allah Azawajal above seven heavens, who is eternal, who is unending, uh, uh, you know, infinite knowledge. So it is an infinite connection that he's given in this time of gloom and despair. Also, Ijabat to Dawa, his call was answered. People started to come in. Kathirat al Ashab, his followers increased and increased and increased. And, and by his death, before his death in the, the Arafat sermon, he had over a hundred thousand people with him. And so it increased. 
And now we can even see and understand this even more than in the past. Because the followers have increased to an unbelievable number. I recently was in Australia and met with an Aboriginal chief. These are the original people of Australia called Aborigines in Malay as Orang Asli. They would say Orang Asli that these people, they're accepting Islam. They're coming into Islam. This is something we never thought was possible. They're coming into Islam. I recently came back from Europe and there, and, and there are now Greek people coming into Islam. The Greeks are coming in. This is something we thought was not possible for the Greeks because of their conflict with the Ottoman Empire, with the Turks. But Greeks are coming into Islam. We established a masjid now in Canada, where I'm coming from now. We established a masjid on the North Pole. On the North Pole, there is a masjid. We car they carried it up and put it in, so now you can make salat on the North Pole. You can call Santa Claus to make prayers to <laughs> when he's up there doing this. Thing. High in the North Pole, Everywhere, people are coming in. People who did not know him, who do not speak Arabic, who have nothing to do with him, are saying, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. From all nations, kathratul ashab. Inna aatayna kal kawthar. Wa salli li rabbika wanhar. Verily, we have given you an abundance. We have given you an abundance. Even his name, which was not being used by the Arabs at the time. Name Muhammad now, they recently did a survey some years back and they found it is the most popular name on earth. How many people are called Jesus? Some Spanish people say Jesus. But it's only a few people who will dare to name their, their child Jesus. How many Moses? How many Alexander the Great? How many Julius Caesar? But the Muslims, they won't say Abdul Karim, they will say Muhammad Abdul Karim. They won't say Saleh, they say Muhammad Saleh. I even had a friend from the Sudan, his name was Muhammadain. That's two Muhammads. <laughs> Another friend of mine, he took out his passport and it said Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad. Three on his passport. Three of them. So it is the most popular name on earth. Look at the miracle in this. Al-As ibn Wa'il. How many people know Al-As ibn Wa'il? Who knows him? Amongst the Arabic people, who knows Al-As? The only way that you might even hear his name is his son, Amr, Sayyidina Amr ibn Al-As, or his grandson, Abdullahi ibn Amr ibn Al-As, that's the only way you'd even hear his name. But Al-As, he's cut off. What did Allah say? In Nashaniyaka, who will abtar? The one who insults you, he will be cut off. You will be given an abundance. This is a standing miracle. And one of the recent uh, conclusions that historians have come to is that even the renaissance in Europe itself, the rebirth of knowledge, did not actually happen in Europe. It happened in the Muslim world. And it was Muslims during the period between approximately 622 to 1492, uh, uh, you know, it's what we call the golden age of Islam. It is Muslims during this time who came out, the Prophet ﷺ said to his followers, those who are present, take the message to those who are absent. So they took it around the world. But they were seeking knowledge. They did not destroy the libraries. They did not destroy uh, uh, the knowledgeable people. They brought them into the Ummah. And so we gain knowledge at an unprecedented rate, a rate that was not known by other societies in any point in history. 
In 100 years, Muslims reached deep into China, on the western side to the Atlantic Ocean, in the northern side to the high Russian steppes, in the south deep to the Swahili coast, off of East Africa. 100 years, no ideology, no leader, no system has ever done anything like this. But one of the unique things about Muslims at that time is that they had open minds. They had open minds. And one of the Khalifas in the Abbasid period even developed what is called Bayt al-Hikmah. He even invited scholars to come in. Invited Hindus, Buddhist, Christian, bring your proofs. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? So knowledge was coming into the Ummah at a, at a rapid rate. Muslims were developing rapidly in Spain and Portugal, known as Al-Andalus. It reached a very high level. Muslims were tolerant at that time in dealing with other people. They took in uh, the, the scholars from the Jews and the Christians. They were not forced to accept Islam. So the Jewish people in Al-Andalus had their a high point in Jewish literature. It's considered the golden age of Jewish literature. The Christians, they sat at the feet of Muslim scholars. And by the year 1000, the city of Cordoba, Cordoba, in Andalus, it was the largest city on earth. This is interesting. In the year 2000, you remember, millennium, right? In the millennium, they're all looking for the millennium bug and some change that's going to come about, some confusion. I think it was Newsweek magazine did a survey. What were the largest cities in the year 1000? And I was surprised to see that six of the ten largest cities on earth were Muslim cities. The largest city was Cordoba. Over a million people living in Cordoba. They had 200,000 houses. They had 600 masjids, 900 public baths, they had hospitals, universities, schools, unions for their workers, trades were being encouraged. One of the great leaders in uh, Cordoba itself who founded Cordoba, Abdurrahman ibn Muawiyah, Saqar al-Quraysh, Abdurrahman al-Dakhil, Rahimahullah, he gave education for all the children in Cordoba. Christian, Jewish, Muslim, all the children would get reading, writing, and arithmetic. Those who wanted to study the Quran and Hadith, they could study also the Quran and Hadith. But everybody would be literate. And so by doing this, they developed an amazing society. And the achievements that Muslims made during that time, I mean, the city of Cordoba, it had lighted streets and running water. It's amazing because it took London and Paris 700 years to reach the same point. This is unbelievable, man. 700 years it took them to reach the point that Cordoba was. This is where the European scholars went. They sat at the foot of our scholars. They learned the basis of the scientific method. They learned the, the concept of zero, sifr, the, the one, two, three, four, five, the uh, numeral system, algebra, algebra, geometry, trigonometry, calculus. They sat at the feet of our scholars and learned about modern medicine, surgery, pharmacology, the basis of just about everything that we have. I was surprised to even find that a scholar by the name of Al-Kashani, he had a rudimentary computer in the 15th century. Even the basis of the computer technology, Muslims had developed it at that time. Even flying, we had a person uh, who was actually flying. So that the roots of the society came directly out of the work 
being done by Muslims. This does not mean we discovered everything. No. The beauty of it was that we were able to take the achievements of the people who came from the past with a Tawhidic understanding, bring them together, Tawheed, Wahada Yuwahidu, not only the concept of God, we united knowledge, sacred and secular. We united people, all different colors, all different races, language, unity. And so, some of the achievements are astounding. From them you find some of the sciences that were originated by Muslims during this period. I'll just name a few for you. Algebra, anesthesia, biology, botany, cardiology, chemistry, dermatology, embryology, emergency medicine, geology, metallurgy, modern surgery, modern medicine, modern arithmetic, optics, parasitology, pharmacology, pulmonary medicine, toxicology, and urology. You also find sciences that were advanced by Muslims. Acoustics, agronomy, anatomy, calculus, electrochemistry, engineering, genetics, geometry, geophysics, meteorology, physics, taxonomy, thermodynamics, and zoology. Our scholars were making amazing achievements. But to stop them, or to, or, or to take it out of history, a type of amnesia was developed in history. They said this was the Dark Ages. They called it the Dark Ages. And they said the lights are out. And maybe it was out in certain parts of Europe at the time, because the Roman Empire had fallen. But for Muslims, the light was shining brightly. It was shining brightly at that time. We brought in so many uh, different products. It's amazing the product. Just to give you a few of the substances and uh, the products introduced by Muslims. Pendulums, cotton, paper, glass mirrors, crystals, street lamps, colored glass, satin, pepper, paper money, postage stamps. Now think about this. These are all the things that make you civilized, right? Postage stamps, uh, book binding, clocks, astrolabes, soap. That was a crucial one. <laughs> soap. Compasses, slide rules, flasks, surgical instruments, windmills, artificial teeth. Interesting. Artificial teeth, spinning wheels, globes, citrus fruits, eyeglasses, porcelain, cables, velvet, almanac. The almanacs that we used to use, now you have Google and whatnot, but we used to go to the almanac before in the encyclopedia, right? It's almanach. It's an Arabic word. We used to go to the almanacs, okay? And uh, saddles and leather shoes. Interesting that uh, a study was done, a person by the name of Walt Taylor, and he, he did a book called English Words of Arabic Origin. This is in the 1930s. And he found a number of interesting things. He found also like Admiral is Amir al-Baha, uh, alcohol, al-Kohol, algebra of course from Jabr, uh, Arsenal, and this is important for the people who are like soccer. Here everybody's waiting for the Super Bowl, right? But if you're a World Cup man, if you come from the UK or Canada, Arsenal, right, is one of the big teams in the Premier League. That's Dar es it's an Arabic word, Arsenal. Second place, in the Second place in the league. Dar es Salaam. This is an Arabic word. The word Arsenal. Also, caliber. Your check. You write your check at the Bank of America. This is sec, right? Cotton. Magazine is mahazin. This is an Arabic word. 
also matrah, your mattress, your monsoons, your syrup from sharab, right? Uh, even the mayor of your city, and I was one time given a talk in Detroit, and I said, the mayor was there, and the police chief was there, and everyone, I said, the emir is here, the emir of Detroit, and the sharif of Detroit. <laughs> and they were looking at me like, you know, well, this is Arabic, right? But the word mayor comes from amir. And the word sheriff comes from sharif. Directly taken from it. Whether you're the sheriff of Dallas, Texas, or the sheriff of Nottingham. And so, uh, it's an amazing uh, achievement. And one scholar, uh, S.E. Um, Al-Jazairi, who has done some recent research, he even took, took it to the extent where, where he, he made the statement, and he's backing it up, that there was no renaissance in Europe. That's a serious statement to make. There was no rebirth of knowledge. Because when you read the records of the kings and the leaders in the 16th century, 15th, 16th, 17th, they were mostly burning witches. They were hunting down women they thought were witches, and they were burning them at the stake. That was what they were mostly busy doing. What it was for Europe at that time was translation. They translated the works that were gathered together and improved and developed by the Muslims, translated them into their, their languages, and then there was a renaissance. So it was not scholars in the 15th century taking Greek books or Roman books from a thousand years before and then uh, rebuilding science. No. That was done by the Muslims. And it was through that activity that we were able to give the impetus for Europe itself. How did Muslims do this? Where did they start from? It came from one man who was by himself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened up on him and Allah told him, Inna a'tainaka al-kawthar fasalli li rabbika walhar. Verily we have given you an abundance. The whole of the Renaissance, all of this can go back to the originator, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who sent out his companions. This is Al-Kawthar. And this is still happening today. The Ummah is expanding. Our potential is getting greater and greater and greater. Right now in Toronto, the GTA of Toronto, it's 10% Muslims in Toronto. From 2.5 million, 250,000 in the official books are Muslims. In Paris, right now, in Paris and Marseille, people for 25 years and under, 50% are Muslims. In Holland and Belgium, over 50% of the children born in the hospitals are Muslims. It's happening all over the place. It is a rise that is happening. But we have to realize we are in a test. The Prophet ﷺ said, Inna li kulli ummah fitna wa fitna to hadhi al ummah al mal. We are under a test with wealth. Overabundance of wealth or too little. Also, we have to look into ourselves. We cry for change. We're going out on the streets. We want change. You know what Allah said? Inna Allah la yughayru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayru ma bi anfusihim. Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in themselves. We would have not gotten into this situation if we did not change something in our hearts. If nationalism, tribalism, racism, class divisions, rich exploiting the poor, if this did not come into our ummah, we would not be in this position. And we're not going to get out of it until we change what is in our hearts. And this is a key point now as movement is going on, especially for the younger generation. It's not just gaining the victory, but what happens after the victory. This is something to think about. Because if we don't change ourselves and have a balanced approach to Islam, not one extreme or another extreme. 
We're going on extremes. We have to stop being emotional, just emotional, and go back to the sunnah and become balanced and to really take this message not only as something for Muslims, we are talking about humanity. Because our responsibility is to the earth. It's to the whole world. It's not just to our little countries. This is what we have to realize. And so it is a very critical period that we are in. We need to make toba. We need to make repentance to Allah Azza wa Jal. And in toba, there is a self-analysis and reconstruction. Self-analysis and reconstruction. That we analyze ourselves, what are the problems that we have within ourselves to get us in this predicament? What is the problem in our relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We have to straighten this out. And then reconstruct. Reconstruct in the way of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Study the seerah. Study closely what happened in the different periods. Take the, the, the wisdom and the knowledge out of this and, and, and to raise ourselves out at this critical point in time. When the Prophet ﷺ used to send his companions out, he used to tell them, Bashiru wa la tu nafiru. Yesiru wa la tu asiru. He told them, give glad tidings. Don't drive people away. Make it easy. Don't make it difficult. Don't make the religion difficult. Don't go to extremes. But be positive. Con be with the, the, not destruction of everything. It is to build everything. It is to rebuild the society. It is to cement relationships with people all around the earth. It is to deal with the crucial uh, uh, problems that are facing people in the world. And so at this crucial point in time, we seek refuge in Allah Azza wa Jal, creator of the heavens and the earth. We ask Allah to have mercy upon all those who are suffering in the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu We ask Allah to have mercy on those who are in the streets giving their lives. May Allah make it easy for them, may Allah unite them, may Allah bring down all the tyrant ta'ghuts that are, that are ruling over our Muslim countries. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a, a, a just society a balanced society and a balanced understanding of Islam. May Allah uh, have mercy upon the, the sick and the weak of the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah uh, have mercy upon all those who have fallen and died from the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah raise up leadership in this Ummah to guide our misguided political leaders from darkness into light. And may Allah raise up an Ummah deserving of the leadership of this world and remembering the blessings that Allah Azza wa Jal has given us. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna a'taynaka al-Kawthar. Wa salli li rabbika wanhar. Inna shaniyaka huwa al-Abtar. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. For those who um, don't have questions right now, we invite you on behalf of the Maghrib Institute. Uh, to come to our courses. Uh, there we will have time and we will go through some of this information in details. We want to give it to you in details and a chance for feedback and relaxed time uh, for the questions um, that, that, that you may have. Yeah. Today, subhanAllah, I, I, I will never be able to look at the Surah the Kofa. It's not the smallest, the smallest Surah anymore. So I, it's, it, I'm not even looking at it the same way anymore. But subhanAllah, today I was just reading uh, CNN published a report today that that 20 years ago, well, pretty much the conclusion was 20 years ago, one out of six people in the world were Muslim. Today, one out of five. In 20 years, the prediction is that one out of four, one quarter of the 25% uh, of the world's population will be Muslim. And they were talking about, pretty much they were like, there was a lot of fear mongering. I was reading the comments, people were scared. They were saying that the, the big Armageddon is there, you know, around. So how, how do we address this? When people come to us, when we talk about us expanding and people really becoming very fear, fearful, how do, we, how do we address it? You know, I, I think it's important that we um, first try to redefine 
what Islam is within ourselves. Because for many people, Islam was more of a family tradition, a cultural type of thing, uh, instead of the principles of Islam. Because if we go back to the principles of Islam, we realize that we are connected to the prophets from the beginning of time. So the original teachings of Moses and Jesus and Abraham and all of the prophets is Islam. And this is what people have to realize. We're not coming with a new religion. We're talking about the same enshrined principles that the prophets and messengers had from the beginning of time. Some of them we know their names, some of them we don't know their names. Also, it is a world view, it is a culture. And if they can see, if they can understand what we have actually done for the Western society, because this image is coming that we are trying to destroy the Western society. We built the Western society. It was built on our backs from the information that we had. And we freely gave it to the people. We freely educated the people. So there was no clash on our part. The Crusaders were not going to save the true cross of Christ because Christian uh, Palestinians had lived there for centuries without any problems. The Church of the Nazareth was there. They were going there because what Marco Polo told them about the riches in the East. That's what they wanted. It was an economic war. And once people realize that there's no clash of civilizations on our part, right? We are coming back to life. We have always respected the traditions of other people. Show them what the Prophet ﷺ did when he first came to Medina. And he, and, 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 he, and, and he developed the constitution where he recognized the rights of minority groups within Medina. So we have, have, we have spearheaded the concept of civil society, the concept open uh, you know, thoughts, we have spearheaded these ideas. And so this needs to be shown uh, to people. But really the bottom line to a great extent is not just our words, it's our actions. We will have to be involved in projects in this society which meets the needs of this society. You cannot think all the time about the other part of the world. If there are problems in this society and we are part of this society, then we need to develop programs to help people. You know, recently in Canada, they did a study and they found that alcohol is more dangerous for a person than heroin and cocaine. Now, this is serious, because we used to consider heroin and cocaine to be hard drugs. And alcohol, well, he just took a little nip, he's just high, and they laugh. Alcohol is complete destruction of a human being. If a person becomes an alcoholic, it's not only him, his family, 25 to 30 people around that person is going to be destroyed. Not only is he destroying his body, he's destroying his relationships, rape, abuse, all types of things, and then accidents on the highway. Look what happens around Christmas season when people are getting drunk. So they have classified alcohol as more dangerous than drugs. Look at our position. We have, we have an alcohol, drug-free lifestyle. Friday night comes, Saturday night comes, and we can smile and enjoy ourselves without getting drunk. This is, this, some people will think it's impossible. You cannot socialize without a drink. He can't talk to her unless he had something to drink. It's impossible. We have a drug-free, alcohol-free way of life if we practice Islam. We have an alcohol-free way of life. And this is what people need to uh, get from us. Because they want to know how can we do this? How can we live? How can we enjoy ourselves with, without the scourge of alcohol and drugs? This is something that we can give to the society. There are many gems that we have within our lifestyle that we can give to the society if we try to understand what are the ills and problems in society and try to help reach out to other communities and work together for the, for the homeless, work together for the needy, work together for the different problems people are facing, then they will look at Muslims in a totally different way. You're no longer just foreigners 
in the building, somebody shouting some strange thing from the roof, and you're wearing these long clothes. You, you, you're no longer this. Now you're a living part of the society. So alhamdulillah, um, it is um, a pleasure to be with you. I pray that Allah protects you and unites you and helps the Muslims at this very critical point in our history. Aqulu qulihada wa astaghfirullah wa alaikum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.